All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Brooks Davis, and I'm here to talk to you about adding system calls uh, to FreeBSD. So to start out, um, why should you listen to me? Well, um, long, long ago, I don't remember how long, but probably 15 years ago or more, um, I tr was trying to add some system calls to FreeBSD, and I got fed up and I, because there was no documentation about it. So I created this add adding system calls wiki page. Um, which many people have expanded since, but I've been documenting this for quite some time. Also, in my current job, over the last decade, we've been developing Cherry, which is a set of architectural extensions to add memory safety and compartmentalization. Um, and to do that in, in Cherry BSD, our fork of FreeBSD, um, I've added Cherry ABI, which is a new was a new compatibility layer and is now the default ABI in Cherry BSD, as well as uh, FreeBSD 64 compatibility layer, much like FreeBSD's 32-bit compatibility layer um, to run, I, for instance, i386 code on AMD 64. Um, this allows you to run standard ARM 64 or RISC-V 64 programs on a Cherry system. Um, also, because I've added those, I added a lot of automation. And uh, like any good computer scientist or programmer, um, and I've converted that, that automation to uh, generate the 32-bit ABI files for FreeBSD32 from a single um, declaration file and a small config file. Um, prior to that, there were a lot of errors because people made a lot of mistakes. So let's talk about why you'd want to add a system call. Um, so maybe you need access to kernel resources. Maybe you need a trusted intermediary between processes, or you want to um, do something like add something like send file, which avoids excessive context switches um, when using an existing API. So with send file, you can say, you know, send this gigabyte of data from this file to this socket on the, on the internet, um, which is really helpful um, and avoids having to go in and out of the program. Um, or sometimes you might have a system, the current interface might exist and do most of what you want, but it's insufficiently expressive. Um, you know, it doesn't have a flag option to change its behavior and you want a subtly different behavior. Um, so those are a number of reasons why you might want to add a system call. Also though, why wouldn't you want to add a system call? Well, the big reason is that system calls are forever. Um, FreeBSD has compatibility with almost every system call all the way back to FreeBSD 1.0, and even I think some that really predate FreeBSD 1.0 um, in, in early BSDs. Um, and all that BERT, that adds maintenance burden. Um, you both in the kernel and in the C library, there's just an accretion of stuff related to compatibility. Um, so you wanna be sure you add the right thing or that you don't add something that's unnecessary. Um, some questions to ask, or does it make sense to use an I, IOCTL or a SysCTL um, instead of a system call? Because those are a bit less permanent. Um, it depends a bit how they end up getting used. Um, things that are used a lot or in critical infrastructure are also forever, but at least it's a, they have, their, have more of a namespace and they're a little easier to, to change. So, Let's first now talk about how system calls work. I'm going to give you a very high level overview of the way um, a system call is made from, uh, the, from user space and then down into um, the top of the kernel. I'm not going to talk about the nitty gritty details of how you actually do things in the kernel, but I'm going to talk a bit about just the overall interface to provide some context for how system calls integrate with the system. So here's a slightly convoluted hello world program. Um, instead of a conventional printf or, or puts, it's using pwriteV, which takes an array of pointer, pointer length pairs. Um, in, and uh, that's passed down to the kernel to do a to print. So there's two parts here. We construct the IO vector, and then we call into the system call implementation in user space. That, that user space implementation is currently part of libc. And Here's what it looks like um, for AMD64. You don't need to worry about reading this assembly. Um, just know that there's a bit that sets a system call number. There's a little bit of stuff that's x86 specific. And then there's this, it calls the system call instruction, 
which generates a trap into the kernel. And so from now on, we're gonna be in the kernel. So on the kernel side, here's a quick overview of what happens. And then I'm gonna talk in a little more detail about some of these steps. Um, so as we saw in user space, we make the sys we call the syscall instruction um, or we execute the system call instruction. That invokes the trap handler in the kernel, which calls into some machine dependent system call code. Um, that from there, system call, syscall enter is called, um, and it calls this CPU fetch syscall argument structure, which fills in a structure syscall arguments um, that encapsulates everything about the system call so that it can be passed on down farther and it can be audited. Um, the system then calls into the actual implementation. Um, and when it's all done, it calls this, this bit of code that re sets return values, um, which we're not gonna really talk about anymore. Um, and then finally, there's this syscall rat, which actually does the return to user space. Um, so CPU fetch syscall args is an interesting bit of code that, that varies on the machine because it depends what the calling convention of the architecture is. From the kernel's perspective, it goes and peeks into the trap frame, which has all of the register state um, of that calling thread. And it looks at the registers there and then possibly goes and reads from user space as required, um, both to get this um, code value, which is the system call number, um, and then it's used to dispatch to the right system call implementation in the kernel. And also to fill in this arguments array, this args array um, with a set of register sized values. So on current FreeBSD architectures, these are either 32 or 64 bit integers. Um, and there's up to eight of them. It's the maximum number of arguments that's allowed. I believe that um, on some systems, I think Linux for open max has the max args of six. Um, but uh, FreeBSD, we have eight. So now let's look at this implementation. The sysppwriteV um, is the designated uh, function to call um, to actually implement the system call, or at least to start implementing. Um, there's an, this argument here, um, this pwriteargs is the user argument pointer. And that's actually cast from that args array that we saw be just previously. Um, I'll talk more about how that works um, in a couple slides. Then inside this particular bit of code, um, we have this copy in UIO function. It uh, takes a pointer to the, um, to the vector that's uh, in user space and it takes a length and then it allocates enough space to create a copy of that in the kernel and copies it in. In the case of the native ABI, um, that's a straightforward copy. It just copies it in. Um, when we get to the 32-bit code, um, we'll talk a bit about, I'll talk a bit about how um, there's a translation that goes on there uh, for compatibility. And then if we succeed there, we call into this kern pwriteV. This is a common pattern in FreeBSD and it's one I encourage in pretty much all system call implementations, even if at the time it's totally unnecessary. It's uh, simplifying to uh, get to the point where you are no longer using a structure of arguments and instead you're passing things um, as conventional arguments um, like to any other function. So that's, that's the basic implementation. We're not gonna talk about um, how kern pwriteV is implemented that's a detail of this particular system call and not a generic thing. So let's talk a bit more about argument handling. So that, that uh, pwriteV args uh, structure that we saw before, here's what it looks like. It's got the arguments um, to the system call. So there's an integer file descriptor. There's a pointer um, to the uh, IO vector in user space. There's a, there's a count of elements, which turns into a length. And then there's an offset T, which is an offset that we're gonna to write to um, on the stream so we can seek before printing or before uh, writing. Now, how does that map into that arguments array? Well, let's look at it. So here's, it maps as a cast and due to alignment. Um, so each one of those arguments array elements uh, maps to one of, the, one of the elements. And on an ordinary little Indian system, this just works. Um, so we have an integer. And so we use 32 bits of 
of the uh, of the arg of the 64 bit argument, and then we just ignore the rest because there's some padding implicitly in the structure. Um, that padding is there because this 64 bit pointer is 64 bit aligned. Um, next up, we have another integer, and the same applies because the offset t is also a 32 bit value. Um, so on little endian, that just works. Um, on big endian, though, we need some padding. So there's implicitly some padding in here um, for each argument that is not a full 64 bits. Um, on, on the big Indian system, it's over here. And then on a little Indian system, we actually do add padding explicitly um, as part of generating this, this structure. And uh, so here, here's that. And then to put it all together, don't read this. Um, it's a horrible mess. This is what's actually in the, the generated file. Um, you can sort of see that there, the arguments are in there. It's really hard to read. I find this file horrible and terrible, and we should do something about it. Um, but uh, it's generated, so you don't really have to look at it. Uh, the key thing to note, though, is that we have these macros that so we have pad left and pad right, and we've had the correct amount for the argument um, based, on, based on that. So that's kind of the basics of how we make a system call, how we get from the trap frame um, into calling an actual implementation and calling a function that is really just a normal C function um, that does the work. Um, now let's talk about the mechanics of adding a system call. Uh, first up, um, the first thing you do is, well, once you've decided what the system call is going to be and what its interface is going to be, and hopefully talk to some people about it and have some feedback, you know, pretty confident in your design, um, you add an entry to this to uh, sys kern syscalls.master. Um, I'll show you a bit more about that later. Um, there's also, you implement that sys fu function that we talked about before, so the, like the sys p write. Um, and if required, you implement a FreeBSD32 version. Um, and I'll talk quite a bit about why that might be required and when. Um, so then there's a, a make command you run at the top level of the FreeBSD tree called make sysent that generates all the generated files. Um, and then you need to export the symbol from libc and add a man page. Um, you might, in some cases, also have to add a wrapper in libc if the interface of the system call is not the public interface. So we have a number of system calls that are used in the implementation of libc or, or in the threading library, or which have an exposed interface and then the syscall is more generic and we hide the actual implementation. Um, so here's an entry in system call, syscalls.master. Uh, this has changed a lot over time. Um, once upon a time, I think it had just the number and the name. I'm not even sure it had a return value. Um, and then it had an argument list. Um, it's gotten more complicated. I've extended it to be multi-line so you can actually read it um, and, and whatnot. So the interesting bits here, we have your system call number. That's how you, the kernel knows what it is you're asking it to do. Um, there's this audit event um, that if you're using the audit framework, this, this gets uh, passed to the audit framework. And then we have some flags here. The first one is STD, which means standard, which means it's part of the standard ABI. It could also be something like um, compat, like compat 11, which means it's a FreeBSD 11 system call. Um, that'll result in the name being generated, name being different and whatnot. Um, I'm not going to go into that here because that's, that's a little bit more of an advanced topic. Um, and then cap enabled means that you can call it when you're in capability mode, which is the, uh, capsicum, which is when you're in capsicum. Um, you've entered capability mode, and now you can't access arbitrary namespaces. In the case of pwriteV, that's fine because the things you want to access are accessible by a file descriptor. Um, and that's that's a decision you need to make about your API and ABI um, when you're and when you're declaring it. Now, let's talk about one more feature of syscalls.master. I deliberately elided some optional things that we do require for implementers in FreeBSD. Um, two things here. These are, the first one is a what's known as a SAL annotation. Um, it's something annotation language. Um, I think not something though. 
It's a, a Microsoft invention um, that's really quite handy. It describes the memory footprint of the function. So it says this pointer points to IOVEC count, this variable here, number of, um, of IOVEC structures. So this can be useful, useful in wrappers or in auditing frameworks and logging frameworks um, to, uh, to, to know what's actually being used by the system. Um, the other part is a newer, a newer addition. This is not part of uh, Microsoft Cell, but is a local edition called this contains annotation. And it's contains and it can have three arguments or three additions here. It can be long, which says, it contains something that is defined as a C language long, um, which in POSIX environments, 64-bit POSIX environments um, is a 64-bit number. And in 32-bit environments, it's a 32-bit number. Um, but it contains pointers. And there's another one for time t, um, which is used to uh, tell when we need to do compatibility for I386, um, where time t is unfortunately still a 32-bit number. So you need to add those. They aren't functionally necessary, except that um, the contains um, affects how the generate how files are generated in some cases. Now, so the back to, to talk a bit quickly about the user space bits. Um, you the libc stub is created automatically unless you do some go to some effort to to disable it. Um, but the symbol needs to be exposed. So you add it to the symbol map, and there's a FreeBSD one dot some random number um, that you need to add it to. The number doesn't correspond to the FreeBSD version, which people find confusing. But as a general rule, just add it to the last one and you'll be fine, um, unless you're adding it to, um, to FreeBSD current after a branch, after a release branch has been created and before um, be before any new system calls have been added, in which case you need to add a new symbol number. Um, another thing, you'll see for old system calls that there's both an underscore underscore sys foo and an underscore foo uh, variant of the system call that's exported. Don't do that. Those were exported by mistake um, and almost none of them ever should have been exported. Um, probably someday we will remove them, but that's technically breaking an API contract. So we will need to think hard about that. Um, and then you need to add a man page, that's important. Otherwise people will not know what your system call does. Um, and then less common, as I talked about before, you might have to add a wrapper to expose an API. So um, for instance, we added a special FD uh, function recently and it added, um, but its actual interface was, a, was a creating event FDs. So event file descriptor is a concept that we got from Linux. Having added things to syscalls.master, you run make sysent, and it generates a whole bunch of files, and you can review the diff and see what, what it does. It will also, in the process, tell you whether or not you need to implement a 32-bit compat file if you've, if you've created your uh, entry in syscalls.master correctly. Uh, this is quite handy because it turns out that um, while it's fairly straightforward to know which, whether or not you need a compatibility layer, even a quite senior developers have been confused in the past um, in both directions, either creating them without any purpose or not creating them when they were necessary. Talk briefly about system call return values. Um, I probably should have talked about a bit earlier. Um, so most system calls return zero or, not, or minus one. Um, and in the latter case, they set an, an error no value um, via some register or another, another, and then there's a C error function which takes that out and actually sets error no. Um, in, in these cases, the actual implementation in the kernel returns either zero or an error value. And then the, the actual fix up happens later. Um, sometimes system calls set a value other than zero or one. Um, return a value other than zero or one. And that's done by setting a value in the thread structure in the kernel um, and very rarely setting another one. Um, one example of that is something like LSEQ that returns a 64-bit value. On 32-bit machines, you actually need to split that up um, and do ND independent things. Fortunately, new system calls that do that are rare. So mostly you don't need to think about it. And 
as an implementer, I would probably choose to do that return via writing to the to a pointer in user space, even if you didn't expose that detail to the user. Um, so when do we need to handle 32-bit? This is, this is actually the reason I decided to give this talk. Um, so because people kept, as I said, people kept getting this wrong. So first of all, anytime you have a 32-bit argument, um, you need to handle, or sorry, a 64-bit argument, you need to handle it because it won't fit in one register and therefore it has to be split up to be passed in. So this is mostly offset T, but there are a couple other types. Um, if you add a new type, um, then you will need to edit the scripts that, uh, that generate this, but hopefully that won't happen too often. You also need to worry about signed long arguments. Um, for unsigned long arguments, um, it works a lot like regular integers. They, they get padded out, um, that they'll get padded out uh, with zeros, so it's fine. But with signed ones, you need to do sign extension um, so that all those upper bits become ones uh, if you have a negative value. And then you need to worry about cases where there are pointer, where there are argument pointers to an object that contains um, something that something that where the ABI differs. So um, this is where that contains argument I talked to uh, talked about before. Uh, comes in, it tells the generator code that, hey, you're pointing to a structure that has pointers or size t's or, or time t's. Um, and then you return, there's also the case of returning 64-bit values. But you don't have to handle um, integers, you don't have to handle unsigned belongs like size t's, um, and you don't have to handle pointers because those are also extended. Um, so that's really quite ha handy. So let's look a bit more at argument handling. So I chose pwriteV because it includes many of the, many of the things that need to be done. Um, so it's a particularly pathological example. Um, so if you see the pwriteV struct, we also generate a FreeBSD 32 pwriteV args. Um, you see the file descriptor is the same. Um, the struct iovec becomes an iovec, struct iovec 32 requiring translation. The count requires, is the same, and the offset is split into two registers. So how does that work in the actual mapping? Well, let's take a look at pwriteV again um, with a set of arguments, and then let's transform it. So we have a couple of, yeah, sorry, there we are. So we have a couple of, uh, of things going on here. We do require this new arg structure. Um, we have to handle the pointer. Um, because of the size t or the, the pointer, because it points to something that differs. And, but there's no, no change here in the actual argument handler. And then we have to handle the split values. Um, this is done, this is generated automatically by the, the make syscall script um, that uh, Kyle Evans wrote and then I, I uh, modified. And, uh, and so it, that, there's that split. However, there's one more detail here that, that I'm missing in this slide. Um, on non-32-bit architectures, 64-bit arguments passed as pairs still need to be 64-bit aligned um, or aligned, or aligned pairwise um, because of the way the calling convention works, in part because when you have too many, too many arguments to fit in a register, they spill uh, to a, a structure in pairs. So on non-I386 systems, we need to add an additional pad, and there's just a thrown away argument value. Um, so that's a, an extra complication. This is also something the script handles, so you don't really need to think about it. Um, but it is, it is an issue that's caused problems in the past. And I think I, I found some bugs where this was not handled properly, maybe even pwriteV um, in the FreeBSD32 implementation. So apparently no one used the system call. <clears throat> or, or possibly it worked by accident, um, which tends to happen on little Indian systems. So let's look at the, the implementation of the FreeBSD32 pwriteV. Um, this is the equivalent of the sys underscore version, um, except that it's FreeBSD32 specific. Um, so first of all, we, got, we have two changes. First, we have a FreeBSD32 specific copy in UIO. This creates a, an, it creates a copy of the IO vector 
that has 64-bit size T's and 64-bit pointers by copying in the 32-bit ones and translating them. Um, next, we call current and PWrite B pretty much the same, except that we use this pair 32 to 64 macro to glue the two arg, the two offsets, the offset one and offset two back together um, into a single uh, into a single number. So it's actually quite straightforward uh, and easy to use. Now, a little guidance on new system call APIs. Um, so most of this guidance, much of this guidance is focused around um, avoiding the need for a 32-bit compat layer um, where it's not necessary and avoiding just general complexity. So for signed long values, I would try to avoid them entirely, either use unsigned longs um, or use integers. If you really need a signed long, consider using a fixed width 64-bit type instead. Um, object APIs, these are, these are the, the, the types of the objects you're pointing to with a pointer. Um, so try to make them the same. You can use fixed width types for that. Um, although if you need to use a pointer, do use a, use a pointer or use a uint 30, uint pointer T, which is an integer that contain, can contain a pointer and not a long. And also please don't use a fixed width 64 bit type. Um, it, because that can be obnoxious. You'll need some translation if you use uint pointer T. Um, but when Cherry comes along, you'll, it'll cause more problems. So better to, better to represent pointers correctly. Um, do, when you do need to store an address, consider using this KVRT um, that I added a while back. It is a fixed 64-bit size and means that you don't have to do translation of addresses. Um, this is for things that are addresses and not things that are pointers, uh, which is an important distinction. Um, and then... For explicit padding, consider the possibility um, that Cherry might come along or RISC-5-128 RISC might come along um, and you'll have 128-bit pointers. Um, so think about if you're going to do explicit padding, think about whether it's actually going to continue to work um, or if it's just going to be weird. Um, I've seen some cases where the result is worse than no padding. Um, also, try to make sure that the memory footprint can be described with SAL annotations. Sometimes this is the case, isn't the case. If you're implementing something that looks a lot like IOCTAL, you probably can't do that because the flag the, uh, the command values encode the size in a way that can't be described. But where possible, um, it's really nice if you can use SAL annotations um, to describe the footprint. Um, don't add new system calls that use uh, variadic arguments. That's, you know, something that looks like printf. Um, there are, I think, three cases in the kernel. Um, the most annoying one is open, um, where people forget to pass the mode when they're creating the file type, so they get register garbage, and sometimes it works for a while until it explodes. Um, we make it explode all the time on Cherry, uh, so it's just confusing, and it also, it adds extra cases to the to the fetch syscall arguments function. They actually have to be handled manually in many cases. So better to use a vector um, and a length or use an always present argument, even if you hide it um, in the kernel. And then think about whether or not there's any possibility that your function might want to be extended or that your system call might want to be extended or changed. If so, throw a flags argument on it, even if you hide it behind a wrapper. So that's the basics of adding uh, system calls to current FreeBSD. Um, now I'm gonna talk a bit about FreeBSD 64 and about uh, Cherry. So the very, very short introduction to Cherry. Um, <clears throat> this is a, you know, we, I could easily give you an hour long talk on this. Um, instead, we're gonna try to do this in a minute or so. So Cherry introduces a new hardware type called the capability. Capabilities grant access to a region of memory. Um, and the validity of those capabilities is maintained by a tag in both registers and in memory. This means if you perform an invalid operation on the capability, it stops being valid, the tag is lost. Also, 
if you perform an ordinary write, so say you manage to do a buffer overflow onto a capability, um, that destroys the tag. Um, and therefore you don't have a valid pointer, you can't use it anymore. Um, capabilities can only be derived from other capabilities. Um, and their permissions and bounds may only be reduced. So there's a monotonicity property here that uh, you can't get access, that you can't manipulate a capability to get access to things that it didn't grant, already grant you access to. Um, as a programmer um, with sort of a naive mindset doing simple things, you can think about uh, capabilities as 64-bit unforgeable fat pointers. Um, and the key thing in practice with capabilities is that all access to memory on a, on a cherry system is via a capability that's either explicitly via new instructions. So you use a load capability instruction to load via a capability um, or a store capability instruction to store or, ex or implicitly via default capability. The default capability functionality is what allows Cherry systems to run existing code um, with no modification and existing binaries with no modification. So there are some ABI differences um, for Cherry ABI. Um, I've got a, gonna, got a whole table here of all the different things that vary in FreeBSD ABIs, or at least the basic machine independent things that do. So the size of long, size of time key, and the alignment of 64-bit uh, types. Um, on Those are the same between standard 32-bit FreeBSD and Cherry ABI, which in the Cherry API implementation was really helpful. That meant there are a lot fewer things we had to change. There are, there are some things that are different. Um, first, pointer size and alignment. Um, our pointers are bigger and they must be strongly aligned, so they must be 128 bits sized and aligned. And also pointer providence. What pointer providence means in this context is that you can't manufacture a pointer out of nowhere. Um, in sort of conventional de facto C, um, you can pass a pointer through a long or you can just make up a number and put it along and then you can try to read it. And if there's something there, you get it. Um, and if there's not something there, you crash, but you know, still. Um, in Cherry, you have to have derived the pointer from another pointer. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the key thing here. Now, ABI compatibility on CherryBSD. CherryBSD is our port of FreeBSD to the Cherry platform. It started out as a port to MIPS. Um, we now have a port to RISC-V and to ARMS Morello, which is a, a variant of ARMV 8A. Um, and we have killed the MIPS port, yay. Um, so here we have, our default ABI is called Cherry ABI. And Cherry ABI, all pointers are capabilities um, in C and in the system call layer. In, and, and then because we have that, and we wanted to continue being able to run existing code, we have a FreeBSD 32 ABI, which you can think of as an analogy to the FreeBSD 32 ABI. It um, allows you to run 64-bit point uh, programs, both standard ones compiled for FreeBSD and also hybrid ones where a subset of pointers are, uh, are capabilities, but the system call interface in particular is just integer pointers. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, um, both long and time T are the same, so Cherry ABI doesn't require some of the translations that FreeBSD 32 does. However, objects containing pointers must be translated, obviously, and and capabilities need to be constructed from those pointers for user space access. Um, because all user space, all access to user space is via a capability, even in an ABI where pointers are integers. So we actually have to construct capabilities in the kernel and we construct them using the default, the default data capability of the process that made the system call. Um, so, we do now, have, though, have to add some new wrappers for FreeBSD 32 and FreeBSD 64 because we actually have to handle every um, system call that takes a pointer. So we need to do some translation of the passed in pointer into a capability, which is not something we had to do with supporting 32-bit on 64-bit um, because we, with Cherry, we can't take advantage of just simple uh, zero extension. So, Constructing user space capabilities. Well, 
to make that easy, we have some macros. They mostly hide everything. Um, we have some weird things though. Um, there are a number of cases where a function will take a pointer or some sort of sentinel value. Turns out all these sentinel values are very small integers. So we, we currently take any, um, any value that's below uh, 4K, so in the first page, which except in some oddball cases of uh, a dot out support, we don't allow mapping of the first page anyway, so that can never be a valid pointer. Um, so values less than that, we treat as we create null derived capabilities, which is to say they're untagged, so they're not valid for access to memory, um, and they have no permissions, and they just contain the number as their address. Um, likewise, we do the same thing for things that are larger than the largest possible address um, that you can have in your system. If we ever had a system that supported full 64-bit addresses, um, we would probably forbid things, um, we would have to forbid things near the very top because that's, um, so right at the 64-bit boundary um, because that's where 32-bit, uh, or that, that's where negative numbers lie when you convert the unsigned into signed. Um, there are two basic macros that are the most common use. There's uint cap, which says take, a, take an address, and a length and make me a capability of that length. Um, capability is potentially approximate, but it's, uh, we, that's, that's the basic concept. We have a number of wrappers around that, um, that that do things like, we have like a user cap obs wrapper, which says there's one thing of, the, of whatever type the pointer uh, claims to be. And you can use that in, in some cases. There are also some awkward cases where we don't know what the size is. So we just have to say, eh, it's all of the user's address space. Um, so for instance, a string that isn't a path um, has no length restriction. Um, it could be any, any size. So we can't put a limit on it um, if there's no, no path size to key off of. Um, yeah, so there's a, hey, there's a number of helper variants. Um, there's too many to list here. Um, however, it's one thing it's worth noting here is that well, this doesn't really change how these programs work, um, it does actually limit errors and exploits. Uh, there was one, there was a kernel vulnerability that I found looked at about I don't know four years ago. Um, that interestingly, capability pointers even in conventional unmodified 64-bit programs um, having limits would have defeated that bug. So it was pretty neat. Um, and can be quite helpful. So let's take a look at the FreeBSD 64 versions um, to contrast with the, the FreeBSD 32 version. Um, so in our implementation, I've added the, an additional wrapper, um, this user, user p write v, um, that sits in a spot between the sys layer and the kern, the kern underscore version. Um, this is just me being tired of duplicate code. So um, I'll show you, the, show you that code in a moment. But uh, once we had for a while, four different ABIs to work with on, uh, on Cherry BSD, I didn't want there to be any duplicate code I could avoid. Um, so we have this wrapper, it's not strictly necessary, but it's there. Uh, we have, we construct a capability from the pointer. In this case, we use this user cap array helper macro um, where it uh, knows it's an array of I of P type and uh, of, I of, e, of I of E count length. And then we're also passing along the uh, copy in function that, that handles copying in the I of vector. And then the actual implementation looks a lot like the old um, sys uh, p write v or uh, freebsd32 p write v. Um, we copy in using the function descriptor and then we call into the implementation. So it's very much the same as it was before. The main difference is that you need to uh, translate the pointer um, and then have a and, and have another copy in implementation. So some final comments. Um, adding a system call is straightforward. I think I've given you a basic explanation of how it works, why it works the way it does. Um, and uh, hopefully that would help if you need, if you need to uh, 
add a system call at some time. But of course, you should ask the question, should I add that system call? And then is the interface the right one? Because system calls are forever. So it's good to get them right. It's good to talk about it, to debate, um, and make sure that you have something that's good. So seek review early and often if you decide to add a system call. And now I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so I guess uh, I got a, a comment from John, uh, John Baldwin, suggesting that I give some examples of when integers are stored in pointers. Um, so yeah, one example that he gives is uh, map failed. So that's what mmap returns um, when there's an error. So it returns uh, minus one cast to assigned value. Um, so that's, yeah, and there's, there's, a, there's a few others. They're not actually that many, but they are kind of a sticky point in the overall APIs. Uh, let's see, Alan says, would there be significantly cost involved in using something like NB less for system call arguments to make it more flexible? Um, I guess having named, named parameters. That's an interesting question. I don't know that anyone has explored that. Um, it would definitely be, I would say it would almost certainly be measurable because even um, branch misses or mispredicted branches are pretty common um are, are pretty noticeable in micro benchmarks at least i think it would depend a lot on um on what's going on you know on, on i guess how expensive the overall operation is whether you'd really notice um Yeah, so for Re Renee asks, um, so you can't add a flag to an existing system call because of the compatibility. Yeah, that's the, the problem. So the problem is that um, what the user space does when it calls is it prepares the arguments that it knows are needed, right? So, it, so when you call a function that has two arguments, it calls it with two arguments and it doesn't worry about clearing the other registers. So you get just random garbage in the other register. So you can't add a new argument because who knows what it would be um, is, the, is the problem. If you had a different calling convention where those registers always had to be cleared, um, so you knew that they were always zero or they were always a trap value or something, then you could extend. But Unix, the Unix world was very much don't add extra registers, don't, which is you know, why open only sometimes takes a third argument. Um, very much, you know, that'd be one extra instruction. So I see someone possibly typing another question. Um, uh, while we're waiting, I just want to comment that the, uh, the picture on my Q and a slide here is a picture of the Morello, uh, chip without a heat sink on it. This is a, this is the arms port of cherry to the, uh, air 64. It's an experimental prototype and. We've had initial hardware since early last year. Um, I had, if you heard a doorbell ring uh, during my during my talk, it is possible that was THL bringing me one finally. Um, so it's pretty cool after ten years to have real hardware. Um, so, so for that, uh, gotta thank uh, the uh, ARM and uh, uh, the UK's UKRI um, Digital Security by Design program for coming up with the $100 million or so it takes to fab a chip. Um, so we get real performant uh, uh, implementation of Cherry. It's pretty neat. We're really hopeful that it's going to be a real thing and we'll be bringing it to FreeBSD uh, in the next several years. Ah, OK, so I <clears throat> another question um, for how to, how to reinvent the wheel of syscall decoding in user space? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, well, if you have SAL annotations, it's generally fairly straightforward. Um, although if you have any kind of flag that needs to be decoded, like there needs to be manual, manual decoding. There's just not much to be done about it. Um, libsys decode uh, helps, helps there. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the, the human readable parts, unfortunately need to be handled by humans. All right. I think I'm going to go ahead and sign off and.
I will go ahead and try to hop onto IRC and if people have further questions. So thank you everyone. <laughs>